Hello, I'm Pastor Rick Boschoven of Trinity Memorial Lutheran Church, and today we're going to take a brief look at the proper distinction between law and gospel. We will begin by asking the great Lutheran question, what does this mean? I call it that because this question is central to the small catechism, asking what does this mean before every explanation given in the catechism. In this case, we will want to understand what is meant by the words law and gospel, and we will begin with an examination of the law. We can think of the law as the whole counsel of God, but we can be more specific and view God's law through the lens of God's commandments given to his people. When we are talking about the law, we're talking about control and all the words having to do with power and authority. And again, we have to define our terms. Power has to do with the ability to do something. Having the power or the potential to direct or move or influence people or things. Authority has the legal right or permission to direct and influence or control people or things. One way to imagine this difference is through that of a police officer. The officer has the legal right to stop your car to direct traffic. You obey because his actions have the force of law. But if you choose to disobey his orders, his authority, the officer isn't Superman. He may lack the power to enforce his orders. On the other hand, the officer may be equipped with the use of power, that is, the use of force, to control the situation. Legally, the officer is not allowed to abuse his use of force. Power must be subject to authority. Therefore, we must understand that all of our rights and freedoms are grounded in the rule of law and that God is the source of that law. Power must be subject to the law or power becomes a law unto itself. What we call the law of the jungle. He who has the power makes the laws. The ultimate power must be located in God, God who is good and holy, or else power becomes abusive. When power does not recognize authority, we call that rebellion and disobedience. This is why I call it the story of the law. The story of the fall of Satan and mankind is the story of rebellion and the result of sin, which is death and hell. God's law is just fair and impartial. But the result of sin in this world is a corruption of the law, and therefore corrupt law, corrupt justice, is likewise unjust, unfair, and self-interested. The grim news of the law is that God in his righteousness and his holiness is just when he punishes lawbreakers with death and hell. And when justice is good and just and fair, lawbreakers are punished and the rebel gets what they deserve. We recognize this whenever we desire to see the wicked get punished for their sins. We like it when the bad guy gets his comeuppance and gets what's coming to him. We cheer when justice is done, except when you happen to be the guilty one. And then you cry out to the judge for mercy. When you ask for mercy, you are asking not to get treated fairly, but to be given grace. Grace is to receive that which you do not deserve. The story of the law is about rebellion and punishment. The story of the gospel is about obedience and reward, and the focus of that obedience and reward is Jesus Christ. God is indeed holy and just and good and perfect, full of love, and therefore God tempers his justice with mercy and grace. In other words, God is holy and as such is not merely fair and just, but he is also loving and kind. We accept that true love is both just and merciful. God's desire to be merciful flows directly from his love for us. 
His desire for us, his greatest of creations, for that is what he calls us in Genesis, his magnum opus. His desire is to redeem us, not destroy us, although we deserve it through our disobedience and rebellion. He is righteously jealous for us because he made us. We are his. He would not see us lost and so sees fit to save us from the penalty of the law, not by ignoring the law for us, but by fulfilling it for us. And this is the good news, the gospel, the God story. God's mercy means he pays the price for our rebellion fulfilling the demand of the law for death, but returning to us life. Since Christ has satisfied the law, we receive the benefits of his merit by faith in his work for us. What does this mean? Well, if justice means that you get what you deserve, well, what we don't deserve is life and redemption and restoration, a second chance. But our God is gracious, gracious and just, and forgives us our sins and delivers us from all unrighteousness. At this point, we need to make a quick distinction between natural law and divine law. Most people recognize the laws governing the visible world, the physical world, but there are laws that govern the spiritual world which we cannot see and yet know exist. But it's fair to ask what the evidence is for this spiritual world. One thing we can see is the evidence that people live and die. Death is an indication that whatever it is that makes up life is far more than merely physical. Likewise, there's evidence in the recognition of such abstract concepts as truth and beauty, spiritual ideals that exist beyond the tangible limits of what is merely physical. Then we have the mass concepts of spirituality, where we can point to the fact that the vast majority of human beings recognize the existence of spirits, gods, so to speak. The overwhelming majority of humanity accepts that the spiritual world is a reality. Even among hardcore atheists, there is the acceptance of an alternate dimension or alternate realities. And finally, in the observance of intelligent design, that the world is somehow made or created or guided by an unobservable intelligence. Now I say this to make it clear that we can imagine that there is a God behind all of it, but we don't have to imagine this God when he has revealed himself to us in his word. He has given us his gospel so that we might know him and believe him and trust in him because of his love, his mercy for us. There are at least six ways that this story of God's law and grace are told to us, and they are very different in their nature, as different as justice is from mercy, as different as the tragic story is from the comic. This first difference is in how they are revealed to us, where the law is written into our hearts. We are hardwired knowing the difference between right and wrong. And if you don't believe that, every child understands the abstract idea of fairness. Take away a baby's toy and see them demand to have it back again. If the law is written on the heart, then the gospel must be told to us. It's a story that we can't even imagine living as we do in a world governed by natural law. We can only guess at the world governed by the divine. But the revelation of God in the story, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the story of God's people, the story of the fall and the Savior, what God has done, it is only contained in the scriptures. All other religious stories are the story of how we must appease God and make him happy in order to find peace with God. The Bible, on the other hand, tells the story of how God made peace with us. Natural religion is all based on salvation by works, salvation by the law. Christianity is unique in its story of salvation by 
faith, salvation through grace and mercy. It is this unique story which sets it apart from all other religions. God's law and gospel are distinct in the content that they deliver. A simple definition of God's law is everything we have to do. The law instructs, the law commands, the law demands. The gospel, on the other hand, doesn't tell you what you have to do. The gospel tells you what Jesus did for you. In this sense, the gospel is less about ethics and behavior and more about who you are in Christ. The gospel addresses your identity, telling you who you are, not what you do. What you do flows out of that identity. You are a redeemed child of Christ. What do you do now? Under the law, your identity depends upon what you do. It comes after your behavior. If you are obedient, you are a saint. If you are disobedient, you are a sinner. But under the gospel, your identity comes first, and it informs your behavior. You are God's child, redeemed and forgiven. How will you live? Law and gospel differ according to what they promise. Now, you might be surprised to learn that they promise exactly the same thing, salvation. Yes, the law of God promises salvation conditionally. It's a conditional promise. If you behave yourself in church today, I will take you out for ice cream later. That is a conditional promise. If you keep the law perfectly, if you behave yourself, you will be rewarded. The ultimate reward is that you live. But who can do this? No one. Being mostly good doesn't save you. The promise of the gospel, however, is unconditional. After church today, let's go get some ice cream. How you behave in church might be implied, but it's not directly related as any child will tell you. The unconditional promise is not based in what you do. It's based on what God has done. Even the faith that you have to believe in the promise is a gift which comes through the Holy Spirit. Law and gospel differ according to their threat. The law threatens death and hell, but the gospel doesn't carry any threat at all. In fact, the gospel is pure comfort. They differ in terms of their effect and their function. The effect of the law is to bring awareness of sin, and it does this in three ways. We call these the three uses of the law. The first being curb, being made aware of the law itself. Like a curb, it functions to make us aware of the road, where it's at, where its boundaries are. And the effect of a curb is to keep us on the right path. The second use we call mirror, because it functions like a mirror to show us who we are, of showing us our sins. It has the effect leading us to repentance. The third use is called rule, and it's really for Christians only, because it functions as a response to the work of the gospel in us. Having been set free of the penalty of the law, it has the effect upon the Christian as a desire to carry out love and to keep the law as best as possible. Now, the law functions to bring us to repentance, and the effect is to produce in us one of two responses— it will either produce in us pride because we see ourselves having kept the law, or it will produce in us brokenness because we see we have not kept the law. Pride will not lead us to repentance, but brokenness often can. Under the gospel, the function is to comfort the brokenhearted and to relieve the guilt that threatens to crush those who despair under the threat of the law. The effect of the gospel is to give assurance that atonement has been made between the sinner and God and to restore the joy of that person through the assurance that their sins have indeed been forgiven. Finally, the story of the law differs from the story of the gospel in this significant way. 
to whom they are told. The pride-filled sinner must be told the law in order that they may repent and receive the story of the gospel. The prideful heart understands no need for any but their own merits and righteous works. They are confident of their salvation because they are good in their own eyes. The broken-hearted person does not need the law to beat them down any further. They need to hear the story of God's grace and restore to them the joy of life. The power of forgiveness is the power to raise the dead to life, and therefore it can restore the worried soul to health as well. Let's make application from the story our Lord tells us in Matthew chapter 13. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field. And when a man found it, in his joy he went out, sold everything he had, and bought that field. Under the law, the law having to do with everything we need to do, the story would apply to us, and naturally, the man in the parable is us. And the kingdom of heaven is so valuable that it's equated to a treasure hidden in a field which we must desire to possess. And we should desire it so greatly that we ought to be willing to give up anything in order to obtain it. That's why you will often hear it preached to us this way. But is it possible? Does it even make sense? Can we give up everything in order to buy it? Perhaps Jesus only meant that figuratively, but how do you get around those words? Unless, of course... It's actually a parable of the gospel, in which case, under the gospel, it has to do with what Jesus does. Therefore, the man in the parable who is doing the work, that man in the parable would be Jesus. And what does he do? The man in the parable gives up everything in order to buy that field. And isn't that exactly what Jesus does? And in his joy, he gives up everything to buy the whole field and everything that's in it, taking on the sins of the world. That means that the treasure that he gave up everything to buy is you and me. We are the treasure. And therefore, we are the kingdom of heaven. And truly, we are. Like the church, God's kingdom isn't merely a place. It isn't simply a building. It's his people and his very precious, beloved, redeemed people. And this is the story of God's grace, giving us life and salvation and forgiveness. And this distinction between law and gospel helps us to see this clearly. And when we share this story, the story of the law, and especially the story of God's grace, when we tell the story, that's the hope that we have that changes the world. Amen.